Hello. Yeah. I think we should start with a little bit of unsolicited relationship advice. Fellas, I learned recently that if your lady ever squints and smiles at the end of a sentence, that sentence ceases to be true. <laughs> and the opposite is now the case. Now, you might be familiar with these sentences. They sound a bit like this. Yeah, Jar, I think you should go down to the pub, watch the football with the lads for the day, have a little day for yourself down there, and I'll watch television by myself here, because I love doing that. Is stricken from the record and we move forward. Uh, here's one for anyone, any relationship at all. If somebody you know comes up to you and says, I've got big news, you should always put down the bag of crisps. Because crisps, ladies and gentlemen, are the worst food to eat if you're attempting to look like you're taking a story seriously. It is physically impossible. You can try, you can be like, simply can't be done. Here's, here's, this is a vital piece of advice, fellas. You need to listen up for this one. If your lady ever asks you to apply fake tan all over her body, you need to be aware that that may not be a positive experience, okay? <laughs> you think it's gonna be amazing, the reality is that it's more like painting a house for an old lady, okay? That's the stress that's involved, trying to get the coats even, trying not to miss a bit, trying to stay under budget. It's crazy, right? Some of the shit that gets shouted at you in this situation, where she's got the back over going, get the middle, get the middle. I can feel it even streaks! I can feel it even... Sometimes she turned around, grabbed me by the throat and said, are you trying to make me look like a fucking Egypt, are you? <laughs> <laughs> you feel like, oh, no, I'm just trying to get out of here by five o'clock, I'll be honest with you. The first time she asks you to do it and she gets angry, you think to yourself, everybody gets angry every now and then, give her a pass. Second time it happens, you think to yourself, I probably did do a shit job, let's face it, I probably focused on certain areas more than others. The, the third time she asks you to do it and she gets pissed off with you, you think, no, this is bullshit. I've been practicing on my legs. This is nonsense, right? <laughs> that was the night I went to my local comedy club. I got on stage and I issued the warning just like I have tonight. If a woman ever asks you to apply fake tan all over her body, it may not be a positive experience. A man seated exactly where you are, stood up and went, fucking right, it's not. <laughs> Try and explain three brown fingers to your friends. <laughs> Which is disgusting, yes, but true. Uh, I used to, before I uh, started doing this for a living, I used to work as the IT help desk for my parents. Uh, <laughs> oh, so, some other people in, the, in this role, yeah. It's, it's not a job that you apply for. You don't see a, an ad go up on the fridge or anything. It's just your parents think that you're waiting by the phone with a headset on, ready to deal with whatever queries they have about anything plugged in the house. Usually the video cassette recorder, in my parents' case, they're never getting a DVD player. Always the video cassette. These calls come at any hour of the day or night. 45 minute phone call about the video cassette recorder. And, and just, so you, just so we're clear, I'm not being mean about my parents here. I'll give you the abridged version of what I would be dealing with on my end of the phone when my father would ring about the video cassette recorder. This is a short version, just give you a brief brief synopsis of what would happen in one of these calls. <laughs> sure, sure, yeah. Okay, and you've said that, you've said that a few different ways. <laughs> All right, great, okay. All right, Dan, what you wanna do for me now is check that it's turned on. <laughs> I'm not actually being like anything. I'm not being like anything. I'm just saying that that has happened in the past. <laughs> okay, cool, cool. If it's turned on, if it's turned on, all you gotta do is press a zero, zero on the TV remote control. It's the smaller of the two. <laughs> There's not a lot in it. There's not a lot in it, but it is definitely the smaller of the two remote controls currently. Zero. I am not shouting. I am not shouting. <laughs> Zip. It's underneath the number eight. I don't know why they put it there. That is the tip of the iceberg, pal. The tip the, and I realized, you need to know this, I realized in one beautiful moment that we have no right to get angry at our parents when they ask us questions about modern technology. They come from a different era, folks. They come from a time when alcohol was believed to be a cure for most common ailments, including alcoholism. A different era. There's technology in this room that would frighten a lot of your parents. This wireless internet in here. They have no hope of ever understanding that. Lights, four-legged chairs, all this shit. They're never <laughs> gonna fully get it. And I realized this in one beautiful moment. It was the moment my father sent me the first photo message he had ever sent in his entire life. 
He had never sent a text before. So when my phone buzzed and it said, photo message from dad, my first reaction was, oh shit. My dad's phone has been stolen. Because there is no way, there was a way. What he had sent me was the most beautiful photo message that has ever been sent in the history of the world. What he had sent me was a photo of a whiteboard with some writing on it that read, haven't quite figured out how to text on this phone just yet. <laughs> There's a baby boom on in Ireland, a massive baby boom, which makes no sense to me because nobody has any money. I think the reason why it's happening is people misunderstood what The Economist meant when they said, it won't be us that pays back this bailout, it'll be our kids. <laughs> my friends are so thick, they thought to themselves, I better get two of those little fuckers. <laughs> I, uh, I think my favorite part of doing this job is trying out new material. And I always think it's polite to ask the audience, about it before I do it. I always say, who'd like to hear the new jokes? And most people go, yeah. So I take out a slip of paper. One night I do this, a woman seated where you are goes, for fuck's sake. <laughs> and I was like, what's wrong? She goes, piece of paper. And I was like, they're new jokes. She goes, yeah, I know, I know. I just don't agree with it. I was like, what don't you agree with? She goes, this is true, Scott. She goes, you should have practiced your jokes before you got here in front of a mirror at home. Now, that is not how it works, okay? And I was like trying to explain to her, this activity is quite like sex in many ways. You could stay at home and practice in front of the mirror <laughs> all you like, but you will never get an accurate reflection of whether you're any good at the thing until you're in the live setting. I didn't do the action on the night, I just added that now for the TV people at home. Uh, but she, she was like, I disagree, I disagree completely, and gets up to walk out. At this point, the man next to her pulls her back into her seat. I was like, who's this fella? It turns out he's a first date. Yes, I believe that made this into a magical situation. <laughs> because everybody in that room, just like everybody in this room, fully understood at that moment the extent of the misery that man was about to invite upon himself <laughs> by pursuing this relationship. This shit got all out of hand. She starts shouting at me. I was like, well, what do you do for a living? She goes, I save lives for a living. I was like, well, are you a superhero or something? She's like, no, I'm a nurse. Now, I have the height of respect for nurses. Who doesn't? But save lives for a living is not the job description. That is a byproduct of what you do. That'd be like a baker putting up his hand and going, my job is to prevent world hunger for a living. <laughs> that is not your job. That's a byproduct of what you So she gets, gets all out of hand, she becomes a shouting match, and it's like, but I do get this story out of it that I start telling around and about. It's like a 10 minute story about what she said to me and how it went back and forth. I'm working out this story in a comedy club, and this will tell you how small Dublin is. There's a kerfuffle five minutes in in the corner of the room. She is at the gig <laughs> with three of her nurse friends. And they're like, it's her, it's her. And she's sitting there all proud as punch. And I'm like, oh shit, oh shit, I'm telling this story. And then I was like, no, hang on. Most of the time when you get heckled, the heckler disappears and you never see them again. Rarely do they reappear when you are armed with a story of their insanity. <laughs> I was like, this, this is fantastic, because this, this is the juicy part. A month previous, when I'd been working out the joke, a guy came up to me after a show and said, do you know who I am? Which is a scary thing to be asked at the best of times. He goes, do you know who I am? I was like, I was like no, are you a baker? Uh, he was like, no, I was the first date. I was like, no way, how crazy was that girl? Which was a brave thing to ask, I realized now, because they could have still been in the relationship. And I've never been so relieved to hear a man go, fucking mental, boy. <laughs> I was like, what happened? What happened? He goes, well, I tell you, this is what happened, right? After the gig, she's still banging on about how you shouldn't have the paper on stage. We go downstairs, down to the taxi rank outside. She goes, uh, uh, we, we head home now. I said, you, you, you get in that taxi, I'll get in this taxi. I'm gonna have an early night, got work in the morning. She disappears into the distance and I head back into the pub for the four pints that I'm entitled to. Which is true, if you are on a crazy date with a crazy lady, you're entitled to four pints to drown your sorrows. He says, I go back into the pub, I have the four pints, take out my phone after half an hour. 85 missed calls. Yeah, that's properly crazy by anyone's definition. That means she hit 55 and thought to herself, I'll give him 30 more. <laughs> So here she is, back at this gig. I'm armed with my story of her insanity. I'm like, how are you doing? I think I know somebody you know. Oh yeah, who's that? Do you know Paul McNally? And you know, you know when somebody blushes and they just go a little bit pink, but you know when they blush so much 
that you can feel the heat from their face. <laughs> well, that's what happened here. I could see the sweat coming off her, and I suddenly became aware that I was a bully in this situation. And I'll tell you honestly, I'm not ashamed to admit it. I wussed out completely. I didn't, I didn't say it to her. I just completely just went, okay, well, have a, have a great night. And I regret it so much. <laughs> You've no idea how much I regret it. I'll tell you why, because afterwards, her three friends came up to me and said, that was mad. She was at that gig, and she was at this gig. It's a small world, it's mental. And you know what the maddest part was? When you went on stage, she didn't recognize you. So when you put out your slip of paper, she turned to us and went, I fucking hate when they have a slip of paper. <laughs> she learned nothing. She learned nothing. And then the next day, she has the gall to ask to be my friend on Facebook. <laughs> That is never happening. There are two buttons on Facebook, confirm and not now. There needs to be a third one, fuck off and die. <laughs> There's only one other person that I've ever rejected. It was a baldy Dublin taxi driver who was so openly racist that on his profile, he listed his hobbies as anti-immigration policy. How is that a hobby? Like, what, what is he doing on Sunday afternoons, penning legislation that he hopes to see come into law? He, his favorite quote was, if you can't pronounce his name, don't trust him. He's, <laughs> just flat out racist, right? Yeah, I, I think I come here as an ambassador as well as a stand-up comic. Like I said, Ireland's in a bit of a situation. I encourage you to visit the country because we really need you to visit the country right now. <laughs> but I will say that there is every chance that you will encounter one of these racist taxi drivers, okay? So you just need to be prepared that they may start a conversation with you in a taxi where they will begin the conversation with this sentence. Did you hear what the foreigners are up to now? <laughs> Which is a great opening conversation starter, but you will learn that that means once upon a time. Because what's about to follow is a racist fairy tale that he has concocted from whatever crazy phone-in shows he listens to. This is word of God. One taxi driver genuinely started a conversation with me with that sentence by saying, Did you hear what the foreigners are up to now? They're breaking into the apartments that they can't sell and changing the locks for themselves. And they can't get them out of those apartments. Now they own those apartments. 50% of those black lads you see out there are living in apartments that they don't actually own. They've just claimed them for themselves using a crowbar. What do you do usually in that situation? You look at them in the mirror and go, yeah, I heard about that. That was dreadful, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I don't think it's good enough. I don't think it's good enough. I think we have a moral obligation to give them a more racist, more fantastical fairy tale of our own in the hope that they will hear it and go, that sounds like bullshit to me, and you go, exactly. So this, this is the fairy tale that I've concocted. You're free to have it. When you're in Dublin, you can use this. Here it is. You let him finish his story. You go, that's bleeding nothing. Do you know what I heard the foreigners are up to now? They're going down to the rivers, lakes, and canals of this country, and they are plucking the feathers off the swans. <laughs> with the feathers and they paste them all over themselves. <laughs> they then go back down to the rivers, lakes and canals and they get in and start posing as swans. <laughs> all elegant and shit. Laugh all you like, I'm telling you it's happening. And this is the bit that makes me sick. 50% of those swans you see in that canal there are not swans. They're black fellas dressed up as swans. <laughs> And the innocent people of Ireland are throwing them bread. They're throwing them bread. And you know what the foreigners are doing with that bread? They're not eating it. They're not eating it. They're fucking gathering it up and selling it back to us in Lidl. That's what they're doing. <laughs> That's my gift to you. That is my gift to you. I will say I've only had the guts to say that story once to a taxi driver. I had several pints on board. I don't know if he did as well, but I swear to God, he looked back at me in the mirror and went, I'd well fucking believe it. I'd well believe it. <laughs> Thank you very much, everybody. I hope you had a great night.